our next speaker is going to be Philip, a uh, co-founder of I Square and a great psychologist. Uh, Philip, do you have a fun fact for us today? <laughs> oh, that's a nice question. Um, no, I was just watching, like looking up north to the park where my where my auntie is living. She she moved from um, Germany way a long time ago, and she's very close. So I'm looking forward to to meet her. Maybe not later on, but but tomorrow for sure. Thank you, Lorena, for. <laughs> And I'll have to share my screen, of course, with the virtual guests and yeah, be very happy to, to talk about the meaningful attention, the way how we see it. And, and let's try to, to define it a little bit to, together today. And um, like Michael already said, um, I need to check on the, on the clicker. lost the battery here, just a second. Um, we have always challenged us with these mimics conferences to, to pick topics that go beyond our, let's say everyday um, life of researchers as psychologists and media experts and, and try to put the, the bar a little higher as, as usual. And um, of course, we always talk about attention and how do we measure it. And we're really glad to have so many experts here today and looking forward to Horst and Jeff's presentation, also to, to Max's presentation and our DAC friends to actually understand this whole attention debate is already a big challenge. And we know it's a big challenge to just define this word, but defining um, the meaningful attention is even a higher challenge. So that's something um, we did. And Lorena, you mentioned it before, um, in the previous Mumex conferences, we talked about the, the human experience, like how do actually humans experience moments of, of joy, moments of, um, of media, of new products. And what we, what we want to do is uh, start this value discussion about, about um, what the attention economy means for, for us and for the society. Also have the debate of the media measurement. And I know um, we have the experts on this discussion right here. And New York is actually um, like the epicenter of where this discussion is taking place right now. And actually this year, there will be many more meetings on this. And we're looking forward to foster the corporations, cooperation that we have in this room, but also the cooperation that we have with our virtual guests and and actually like also to be academia, um, to, be, to be involved in this. And um, when we talk about attention research and kind of reflect on what we also did in the last 10 or 20 years, we always liked to focus on the implicit, right? It had always been our, our aim and our goal. And sometimes we also forget, of course, there's more than just these very early, very automated, um, processes, there's more than, than the um, automated attention processes. And there is two systems. So we explained there's implicit and explicit. But if you also look at the textbooks, and when we teach our students at, at class, and we do business psychology, you know, there's these models where it's about persuasion. It's about understanding how can we also get people's attention, but we never really thought about what do we do with the attention or do we actually value the people's attention and do we even understand how our attention is connected to our, to our um, well-being, to our, to our mental health. And all of these aspects, of course, in our normal research projects, we don't talk about them, but it's still something very important. And in this age that we live in now, we can call it like the age of awareness. We know pretty much everything what's going on in the world. We understand how our brain works. We understand how the weather works and the universe and everything. And so we should also be aware of um, yeah the consequences if when, when we spend a lot of time on something that's not good for us. And we all know what I mean, like the infinity pools or watching the wrong thing too long. And all of these things are connected to meaningful attention. So there's two perspectives on it. Let's say there's the consumer perspective or my personal perspective. Like how can I actually decide on what I want to do 
with my attention. And the consumers are already at this point where they are holistic human beings. They're responsible people. They know how to spend their time and their money. And they are much more aware of everything um, than maybe even 10 or 20 years ago. And there's also the other perspective, which is the corporations. And also all, all of our clients and of our partners, they think a lot more about their responsibilities, not just because they have to write them down into corporate social responsibility, you know, policies, but also because they believe in it. And a corporation that has higher standards ethically will also understand what we mean when we talk about meaningful attention, because the advertisements in the last 10 years, if you look at them, um, they reflect this responsibility a lot and not only try to get the attention or cut through the clutter um, or just to, you know, try to get contacts, but actually try to get something that has an impact so that the people understand or think about an ad and also the product perspective, which my colleague Lisa would represent much better now than I can do, but sadly she couldn't she couldn't be here. Um, also the question of um, time well spent. And this discussion will also introduce a bit. It's basically coming from Facebook and from Google. So actually making people or enabling people to decide is is my time well spent on my device, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Google. And these discussion um, is what we'll um, want to talk about a, a bit today. The attention economy, I don't have to explain to any of you. This great researcher, um, A. Simon, he, I always thought he is a psychologist, but he's not. He's a, actually a political scientist. And, um, but he, he did such great work in cognitive psychology about, um, about biases and about, um, yeah, that, that basically we do not all follow our rational mind all, all the time, but the sentences, I mean, he wrote here in the seventies, even they're just still so true. And the information density creates this poverty of attention. That's basically um, what, we're, what we're talking about today. And deciding on where I can allocate my attention is for us human beings is almost even impossible. And now this is jumping around a bit too fast, I'm sorry, but um, it's, a video from Times Square, which is obviously uh, a, not a very normal day example, but um, the question of if attention and these contacts can be meaningful or if this person would even remember any of it is, of course, um, a fair one to ask. But it's, it's still a lot of fun to go to Times Square and to get this load of sensation, right? That's why people go there and, it's, and this is totally our, our right to do it. And um, not all attention has to be in that way totally meaningful, can be distracting and, um, and still fun. So we don't wanna say like there's a good and bad attention, but we want to definitely say there's something that we want to add to the normal attention measurement. So we say the um, meaningful attention is attention plus something else. And what this something else is, is in a matter also something what we want to discuss with you today. So something else could be that there's a meaningful other that gets attention, that there's a that there's a actually a person or in this case a dog that gets attention because this dog will, you know, give me something positive back. And that's how our attention system works. Like everything I, I see will be tagged automatically by my, by my brain, will be connected to emotion immediately. And um, Damasio would call it somatic markers. So everything around me will be, will be tagged. So my, my brain can predict, okay, if I look over here, this might be, something positive, or if I look at a person, this will definitely be something positive. And in this case, it's it's the dog. And this um, adding something we we try to connect to the to the three system. So we have the, the system zero, like Michael mentioned at the very early, the perceptions, the the pure, the pure 
let's call it um, visual perception in, in this case. Um, we have the system one, which which you which you all know, um, in, we highlighted the feelings here, so the emotions, how how do I feel um, the the pleasure seeking? So actually going to the Times Square is very much connected to, to these two systems. And we have the explicit system, the thinking. So this is something we when we when we do our attention research, we actually didn't highlight that much because um, we always thought, like, oh, okay, attention, it's it's just about all of these very pre-conscious um, processes. And still the 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 system one with the emotions is something we'll we'll discuss today. Um, how how these are connected and how all three of them are connected to to meaningful attention and um we, you could argue if they all play together then the meaningful attention will reach its highest level and um a second let's say definition or um or a sentence for meaningful attention would be that it's always directed towards something good true and beautiful and michael you you mentioned it before um, so that attention actually reaches uh, a higher level, we would say we can look at something that attracts our eyes almost automatically in, a, in the way of beauty or, or design. Um, you can say that the feelings, the positive emotions, either the pleasure seeking emotions like like or the excitement like the, in the Times Square example, um could be could be a good um example or it could also be um something where I'll try to avoid something negative right and and we have the 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 explicit system like I mentioned it here um before where personal values and also rele relevance comes in so all of the things that I bring in my personal history and it's a subjective thing when we talk about meaning, obviously, we it's difficult to define um, things that will work for everyone. And one example could be art. And art obviously brings the, the beauty aspects and the aesthetic aspects, and it will trigger emotions. And um, you can obviously think about, about higher things like the history, the artist, and in this case, the person, and I might as well spoil it, Michael, that it was that it was it was you um, um, stopping at this at this piece of art. It is subjective. Like I couldn't have personally predicted where Michael will stop. It's a Goya, is it, Michael? Is it Goya, the artist? And um, I forgot the name of the painting itself. But um, for Michael, this painting had a meaningful. Um, you had a connection to it, so this is this is why this moment was a moment of, of meaningful attention to you. And I guess we also spoiled a bit now of the art class we'll we'll do tomorrow, where you are all invited at the Metropolitan tomorrow at ten, and that's also where we will hand out the eye trackers where we recorded this. So this will also be a bit more of our demo day. We'll skip we'll skip the demos today, and um, the the point of um, having something that is beautiful, that is true and feeling good, if all of these things come together, art can be, can be a good um, example for this. Mm. The third point of, um, of uh, yeah, the definition that we're trying to do here today is that meaningful attention is focused and it's, positively engaged rather than totally scattered and um and maybe um maybe distracted and the the focus is going very closely to the theory of, of flow that's what we mean right that you're that you're actually in this moment and you're you're very en engaged into something and um there is a lot of examples of yeah social media of being being scattered attention and we all do a lot of media research with eye tracking. We know that even short moments here can have meaning. And um, but what we wanted to to also show you is that the um, the big companies from the Silicon Valley um, are 
thinking about this since about five or 10 years, like what this scattered attention or non-focused scrolling um, actually does with us. And um, the, I forgot the name of the, um, the Netflix series, Michael, do you remember? The Social Dilemma, I don't know if you've watched it yeah, and you're, you're all nodding and um, I don't have to go too much into it. But um, the, the big companies, definitely say that the time well spent is something they focused on. And this is from um, 2018, right? So the, the, the debate has been there for, for a long time and staying connected, bringing people closer, that's what they, how they define time well spent. And um, this is a research focus of my colleague, Lisa. She's our um, director of human experience and her focus is positive psychology and actually her research, her PhD is on um, time well spent. And to understand from the psychological, from the positive psychology, how can we design products, brands, ads, everything towards, towards this goal and helping people to, to spend time better. Elon Musk said it, that unregarded user minute is the metric that matters and goes into the same direction. The unregretted user minutes is actually something that you might remember. You know how it feels like when you you were maybe engaged for half an hour on on a media, but it was not not something that you would remember or where you'd say like, would I do this again now? Would I do exactly this 30 minutes again, that's something, and it goes more towards the regret phase. Unregretted user minutes is something where you learned something or you engaged into something that made, made sense to you. And the fourth point we wanted to make is the positive long-term value and real life impact um, points. That's attention um, where we actually spend time on something that has a meaning for us. And these can be totally, totally different aspects of, of real life impact. Like some people might think of ecological aspects while, um, while shopping, there might be social aspects, there might be responsibility aspects, so very wide range. And so what Lisa did is actually, um, she did a research on, on well-being uh, or products that mediate um, well-being and from the subjective perspective. And in this, qualitative psychology study, um, she asked people to bring products, any kind of products that have a well-being aspect to you. And people brought all kinds of stuff, like you can tell, and she tried to find out in these very long interviews, why why this, this like give well-being to you? And of course, like I have this fitness app and that's well-being and my shoes are connected to this. Um, I, don't, I don't know about the, the souvenirs, um, there's of course digital services that are very well connected to to well-being, and so she learned a lot about these different um, products. And yeah, one product that um, um, was of course in, in focus is the meditation app, um, Headspace. In this case, to try to learn how how this effects and how this product specifically also helped people to. Um, be encouraged for well-being. And it's a very, very interesting theory behind it. And that positive psychology has a, a model for it already, the PERMA model that helps designers to create for well-being and for, for meaningful attention. And actually, I don't know if I, I can do it, Lisa, you, otherwise you would have to help me. So it's positive emotion, engagement. This one I forgot. <laughs> um, um, I have to look it up. This for, this is meaning. So they design for meaning right within their sprints in in their in their product design um, cycles. And and then let's let's see if I can if I can pull it up. Yeah, it's relationship. The I was for relationship, and this is for accomplishment. Actually, accomplishing something higher. And so the UX world and the, they they are definitely ahead in, in that case. And there's some nice examples and Lisa gave us a lot more, but I'll um, watch a little bit on the time. Um, Google Photos is a nice example that will help you to remember nice moments without having asked for it. <laughs> but um, um, So there will be collages collected. The algorithm actually 
select photos of people that you um, that matter to you and um, there's a moment a day and of course I can share it with these people and relive through it and not just forget these moments because they're just somewhere in my in my timeline and um, these short-term metrics where this is a long-term user values all of all of these big um, companies work on it and think about it so it's about deep versus just more interactions it's about um, long-term satisfaction and not just you know short-term shopping and and it's also about new insights and um, about also reconnecting learning supporting so the whole social aspect is of course very very important and the the last point um, we collected is the meaningful attention that it's effective and that's also very important for for us and for our clients and um, that something is effective doesn't um, need like the correlation between let's say meaningful attention and effect is something like we we look at in our research like in this in this graph for example we see the recognition and we have a big media benchmark of put all of our ads where we measured attention in here and we see that even short time frames like say these first 2.5 seconds are enough to create um, um meaningful attention and and so it doesn't need to have like a, a totally long elaborated look on on an ad like a, an ad can be looked at shortly and it can still work and like if i if i show you an ad this one and i go back um that was a second and for the us americans this might be more meaningful than for the europeans um and in the us americans you can split people in half for some it will have a positive meaning and for some a negative meaning because this the sports star um where the nike chose to put directly um on the stage um yeah he was the one who who kneeled um during the anthem and of course that is not always um an, an easy statement for so some people liked it some people found it disrespectful but Nike chose it and said I believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything and you know what he sacrificed Ben you probably know best like as a his career so he sacrificed his whole career just by kneeling yeah and Nike thought that's meaningful for them and um of course there's many other great um examples we we have seen one and um we can sum sum these um points up what we mean with um, meaningful attention we have different ways of measuring it and we'll talk about that and i'm also looking forward to the talks of um max and horace who are coming up next who are also showing us like how we can measure these things better on the on the emotional part and on the explicit part and on this very early perception part where we cannot ask people about like um did you like it and um yeah so the technical measurements there were at a very high level of things that we can measure these days um we can help um creating products and communication that actually target long-term positive um values and relations and we can try to remember to yeah treat the consumer's attention as as a very valuable and scarce you know resource and um help our clients to to also see the attention from from this perspective and um so these these five points is what we went through and i guess that's that's it from my side and i thank you very much and we'd definitely be open for question and i i forgot to, i forgot to ask in the beginning um if there was a a meaningful moment in your in your attention span you know today and it's it's difficult like to actually time trying to reflect maybe that's also something we can talk over the day like to remember a moment that 
that I found where I spend my attention meaningful or where I received meaningful attention, definitely your attention now made my day. So thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, Lorena, you, you're, you're up next, right? <laughs> oh yeah, Horst had a question, thanks. Yeah. I'll come a little. Okay, I'll come a little closer to you with the microphone. Oh, Sorry. Am I supposed to use the microphone? Yeah, for our virtual guests. Oh, okay, I better think twice about what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, so uh, in the opening, uh, in, in defining meaningful uh, attention, you focused on beauty and the good and truth and all of that. And at the very end, when you showed the Nike ad, um, you mentioned that it's sort of subjective and all of that. So my question is, uh, in the way you define it and think about this, if somebody pays attention to something and evaluates it and comes to a very negative emotional rejection conclusion, uh, that is that mean is that still a process of meaningful attention? Yeah, I mean, that's good. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> no, I was hoping you would say that. Yeah, no, we we actually um, like when we had our internal workshops and we say like okay is meaningful like is it always just positive and do we do we positive wash everything now or but um no i would i would also say the reaction the system one can be can be negative and i i would still engage in, in a in a meaningful discussion yeah. with, the even though i would maybe reject it like the ad there is an example where where some people would not argue that they like it um, and still it can be meaningful yeah but in a way i must also say i i don't know how to answer <laughs> the question i don't know maybe michael do you have a, a better answer you have a very good answer no no it's fine yeah and i agree negative meaning negative. might help you survive and actually live angry. yeah yeah and next you had a you had a question as well right well i was gonna say when it seemed like uh, you were looking for a word to describe all of this and positive appraisal sensations would probably be the, the thing. The appraisal say, sensation. But. Yeah. I know Lisa had a slide with the appraisal theory. It's a, it's a psychological theory that helps us to, yeah, kind of put our emotions into a, like good or bad um, direction and interpret them. But the appraisal theory, yeah, maybe that would, I shouldn't have taken out maybe. <laughs> Hey, Philip, is, how do we define wasted time? Is it a very subjective thing or is it something that can be objective? Mm -hmm. um, so that it's, it's also, it's also, it's also a slide I, I took out. Um, do you know Nir Ival? He's an author. I think he's probably, he's also from, I don't, is he from New York? We, we asked if he could speak here, but um Let's say his daily salary was was a bit bit too high, <laughs> and he wrote two books. And the first one, like in maybe five years ago, it's called Hooked, and it's all about you know our habits, the negative habits, how we're hooked to the phone and to all of and to yeah things where we're hooked. And the the next book he wrote when he realized okay, it's it's actually not about these negative aspects is um is about um the i think it's called distracted um like how we solve this and he he talks a lot about um the the aspects um the time that we spend like that is good good for us um like this well-being aspect follows like a like a similar model that these ux people have here like it's a it's time that we um um yeah spend there's the social aspects definitely like always on top and you know that as a family father that the time is not well spent when you spend time with your kids and you have your phone out so he would recommend in his book um okay he sets times like could just be 30 minutes but ideally it's like one or two hours when the phone is in the other room and he's in focus with his kids and not distracted and this um spending time focused with a person or at work is probably let's say the highest um value i don't know if that answers your question but i forgot the other parts in this book <laughs> and but it's funny like since he he actually switched his whole role of like 
this one book on being hooked and then the other book of actually becoming people becoming better um focused persons but yeah sadly no evil i think he wanted um definitely more than fifty thousand for a day for for speaking <laughs> so no, maybe not <laughs> but these books we can definitely recommend sorry i forgot whether did we lose the other microphone or Mm. Over there. Ah, there it is. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, guys. And then we'll have a do we have a coffee break now? Come on. Thank you, Philip. We do have a coffee break coming up uh, for 30 minutes. Um, so thank you, Philip, for that great presentation. Um, so maybe I don't know if anybody would like to answer Philip's question in the beginning. So, uh, some of the things that you have given meaning to what that you know captivates your attention. I think. Uh, when you mentioned the Google, how Google sometimes will tell you, oh, here, three years ago, this was it. I love that aspect of it because then it takes me back to a time uh, when my baby was a month old or two months or where she took her first steps and things like that. So that's captivating to me. And then going back to Times Square, like I said, this is my second time in NYC. And so I was here last June um again with philip and and michael and it was my first time in times square and exactly what he showed there is what i had uh, what i went through in my mind because i had never overloaded my senses with that much wealth of information i walked through times square and it was big screens multitude of people and they were talking to me and there was construction noises going on and then passerbys having conversations on their phone where my brain just kind of uh, you know had to restart and i had to like shake my head and say okay let me pay attention, Philip, to what you're telling me, because uh, I, I was just having my senses be um, overloaded. So it, but it was it was meaningful in the way that, hey, I'd never gone through something like that. And now I will always remember it. <laughs> so um, any other questions for Philip or we can go ahead and take our break and come back at 1130, 1135, 1135. Right. And then we'll have Max and horse coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.